Welcome back to Talking Shop with Shop Saber. I'm Brandon. Jesse, you're back. I'm back again. Well, that beard's still here, too. It's getting better, too. Look at that. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's not getting better. No, it is. Brianna got me some uh, beard oil and beard cream for Father's Day because she, uh, I don't, I think she knows how long this is going to last. It's going to be around for a bit. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, unfortunate for all of us. But uh, nevertheless, that. I guess, here we go. Here we uh, go. What uh, are we talking about today? We're going to talk about what options and when. Perfect. Like, what options do you buy and when do you buy them? Like, why do I need certain options? I mean, that's something that I think we get a lot about. I mean, a lot of people call up and ask, like, do I need this or why do I need that, right? Yeah, I think this is a great thing to cover. I mean, we talk about options every single day, right? That's one of the biggest parts of our conversations with our customers. Yeah, and that's something that I think anybody who's listening is going to talk about with anybody that's buying a machine, right? Well, you know, the reality is, is the machine has to come with something. So, right. you know, you're going to figure out what's on I'll take on the it. plain frame, please. I'll take nothing, please. How much will that be? Uh, it'll be nothing, sir. <laughs> oh, that's a good deal. I'll but you're also going to cut nothing. Oh. What? I thought I was getting something. No, let's talk about options. Maybe no, I can talk about options. <laughs> this is really derailing fast. Um, but yeah, no, let's talk about options. So, um, you know, how can you, how can you buy a machine? I mean, let's talk about that first, right? There's, there's a couple of ways that you can really buy a machine when we start talking about it. You know, there's really the used market. Right. There's new machines. And then there's kind of, you know, new machines that are custom built, you right. know? So you have basically three ways of looking about it. It's, it's kind of like buying a vehicle. I mean, if we look at it, right, you can drive to the lot or you can buy a private sale machine, whatever you want to do, but you can buy something used and you're going to get whatever you find, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's very similar to what you said, buying a car. Yeah, you, you can pick out what you want. I mean, you can say, I want the blue one and I want it to have the wheels and the, this, but the reality is you got to find one then used, right? Correct. You're, you're, you're kind of narrowing it down and making it hard on yourself to find something used. Right. So you have to kind of be versatile with your selection when it comes to that because you might give something up or end up with something you don't truly want because you're looking for a used machine. Right. And then you have the option of looking at new machines. And a lot of people, when you're buying new machines, you know, there's a lot of companies out there that are cookie cutters, right? Yep. I mean, how many times do we hear that? Like, oh, yeah, this is the one I got, right? Yep. And that's the one they're going to sell you. And then magically... It's the one that fits your application because they have it. Absolutely. Right? Isn't that magic? I got the right machine for have you. I sitting got it. Back. Weird. We just happen to have this one sitting on the floor. That is what a perfect. Weird. But yeah, you know, everyone gets the same thing on those type of situations, you know? And the, the problem with that is, is you end up in a situation where, like I said, it's a cookie cutter. So it's not really built for versatility. Right. You know, it's really not. It's built kind of just as a, this is an easy way for us to build a machine more than anything. It's basically easier for the manufacturer is really what it's designed for. It's convenient for us, so this is what yeah. you're getting. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of how I look at it as, you know. And then you have more of the shop saber mentality of it, which we call it, you know, we call ourselves custom builders. And, yeah. you know, I know people call us up and they're like, well, you don't custom build. You know, you guys don't. Yeah, we don't build different frames. We don't build, we have a set cookie cutter frame, if you will. Right. But then from there, we bolt on the options, the accessories that you need. Right, and we can customize that because we have a ton of options. So there's where our customizations come in. Correct, and so it still makes it a custom machine because it's built specifically. If, if Jesse, if you call up and you tell me you need a machine, we're going to talk. We're going to go through some questions, are we not? Absolutely. You're going to find out every detail of my project. Yeah, and when we do that, then I'm going to start selecting from a list of things that you probably don't need to spend your money on and right. some things that you probably should spend your money on. Absolutely. And so, you know, as we kind of talk about that, you know, you need to figure out how do you configure a machine and what's your specific needs. Let's, let's be honest. Cabinetry. There's a specific package for cabinetry. Absolutely. There's a specific ca uh, package, excuse me, for signs, right? Right. You have the sign industry. And then if I'm a plasma cutting guy, I mean, that's, that's a whole different world. Yeah, try know? making cabinets on one of those. Yeah, right. And then, uh, you know, job shops. What if you're a guy that just brings in work all the time and it's always different? I mean, you're going to need some things that maybe the cabinet guy's not even, you know, getting into. Right. You might need a variety of options. Correct. You and never know what's coming through the door. Correct, yeah. And so, you know, you might need a hybrid between cabinets and signs or, you know, whatever it might be. So there's a lot of different things you can look at. But, like, let's just kind of jump into it real quick. You know, yeah. if I'm a cabinet guy, Jesse, and we're looking at a cabinet machine, I mean, we both know what's one option for sure that we're putting on a cabinet machine every right. time. We're putting a tool changer on. Every time. I mean, that, that's a perfect That's example. a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. If you're a cabinet guy, a tool changer is a must-have. You know, and there's, there's some sales guys out there, we run into it, that we hear them like, oh, they said I don't need a tool changer. They were like, wrong. Yeah, like, okay, I guess if you, you don't want convenience, yeah, I mean. I usually started back with that, like, do you want to stand there for yeah. eight hours a day and change bits? Well, no. Okay, well, then you need the tool changer. They why lie. buy the machine at all, right? right? I mean, that's my thing is if you buy a CNC machine without a tool changer and you're doing cabinets, why'd you buy the machine? Because you 
really are going to be standing there watching the machine do all the work that you would normally be doing. I mean, I guess, yeah, it does speed things up a little bit for you, but you also added a bunch of labor to watch a machine. You just became a babysitter. Yeah, and like that's to me, to me, that any sales guy who's willing to tell you like you don't need a tool changer, he just doesn't know what the heck he's talking about. Doesn't understand, about. yeah. Or get it. that's what he has on the floor, and it's convenient for him to sell you. <laughs> yeah, you I know? got this one out back. You yeah. don't need the tool changer. Trust me, you don't need a tool changer because I got one here that I can sell you. We're we'll gonna wrap yeah. up right now. Yeah, you know that's the thing is, and unfortunately, a lot of these machine manufacturers import from you know other countries, right? And so they are kind of inconveniently stuck with what comes over and if it's one of those not popular configurations like a non-tool changer yep. they got to try to push it off on somebody right eventually got to buy sell that it. machine yeah, somebody's got to get it so uh, the reality is is you know you end up being the business that has to make it work for your environment and i know there's somebody out there listening right now that's going you're speaking to me right to like, me yeah like i'm sorry that we I are we are yeah, speaking right to you. to you yep put the cheetos down what is that cheetos the uh, Man, I want some Cheetos. <laughs> I now. want Cheetos. Now Why do you gotta bring up food every time we do this? I really like food. Dang. But <laughs> the reality is, the uh, the cabinetry industry, you know, has a set of options, and it, you know, typically, I'm gonna run through it. Yeah. What I would say, away. you know, as a typical cabinet shop, what I would tell you to look at is, you know, you want something that's got a tool changer. Right. You want something that's got vacuum hold down. You know, those are two must-haves in my. Those opinion. are huge. You know, I personally would say, you know, pop-up pins and reference pins. You know, for sheet alignment, that's, that's a must-have. I mean, you're We're also lazy, though. Like, I don't want to mess around with that. I Correct. want to push it into the corner. Well, plus, let's just, you know, put it in retrospect. You're putting 20 sheets through your machine a day, right? Maybe 10 in some cases, maybe 30 in other cases, right? Yeah. But the reality is, is you have more than one sheet. Do you want to set the job up every time you load a sheet on the table? No. I don't want to do that. That's what I just said. I'm lazy. Yeah, I exactly. want to push it but up I want it to be pens. accurate. That's my thing. That too. You know, when you put that second sheet up there, I want it to be the same as the first sheet. So if I have 10 sheets to run in a row, just keep loading and cutting parts. It saves right. me a ton of time and hassle. Right. You know, and that's, you know, let's go back to, again, cabinetry. What if you have to do double-sided machining? Your interior cabinet has holes on both sides, so that way it's a shared wall. Yeah. You need to be able to reference that sheet when you flip it. Certainly. So there are certain situations where, like, those three options to me is a, is a must-have. Right. Tool changer, vacuum, and, and pins. Pins help with repeatability. That's yeah. for sure. You know, and then, you know, you start looking at tool changers. There's different, you know, options for that, too. You can go with a 5-horsepower, a 10-horsepower. Some people call them 12s. Some call them 6s. Whatever you want to call them. I don't care what the competitors call them. But the reality is you have various horsepower ratings. Right. Buy as much horsepower as you can get. Why wouldn't you? You can always turn it down. You can't turn it right? up. Right. I, I talk about four-wheel drive truck, right? Yep. Drive a four-wheel drive pickup truck in Minnesota. Doesn't mean I drive around four-wheel drive all winter, all summer long. Yeah. Right? But I Correct. have it if I need it. Exactly. It's better to have it, not need it, than to need it, not have it. Right. You know, and that's the reality with horsepower is horsepower means a number of things. One, how much can I cut at one time? You know, and with three-quarter inch material, I want to cut it in one pass. Um, you know, the other thing that you're looking at is how fast can I cut it? Right. You know, and I'm not saying a five horsepower can't cut it single pass cause it will yep. absolutely. It's just not going to do it as quick as a 10 horsepower because it's torque level. Yep. You know, the other thing is, is how large of a tool can I turn? The larger the tool, the more the, di- or, excuse me, the, the larger the diameter, I should say, not larger tool, the larger the diameter of the tool, the more I need for torque because generally the larger diameters are going to spin at a slower RPM. Right. And so as you lower the RPM, so does your torque curve. It falls off. Therefore, you need more torque. So these guys getting into live edge cutting, you know, guys getting into like MDF doors, guys doing dovetails, the stuff where you have these large cutters, you need to think about the torque. Absolutely. And again, sales guys out there will tell you, oh, you can do it with less horsepower. They're not wrong. You can do it, but you're going to fight it all the time. Right. And eventually you're going to hit the limitations of what it can do. Right. And then and you keep pushing those limitations. The next thing you know, you're repairing your machine. Or replacing your machine. Or replacing. And then you're buying your second machine the first time, right? Yep. That's why we buy the second machine the first time, as we said. So, you, yeah, with our machine, that's the benefit of it is that with our systems, you end up with a better configured machine. Um, the other thing that you find, let's look at the sign industry. The sign industry is completely different, right? Yeah. In some applications, there's guys that can get by without a tool changer. Yep. They're only cutting the same thing over and over in their shape cutting. Absolutely. You don't necessarily need a tool changer for that. Right. But then there's guys who are like, I do a little bit of everything. I do yeah. dive on. I do acrylic. You know, I do foam. I do wood. Well, you just named a bunch of different bits. And you're going to need a bunch of different holders. Yeah. So you might as well buy a tool changer right. because it's better to set your tools up one time, have them sit on the machine, and then even if you're only using one bit for that material, you're not having to set your tool up every time you change material. You go back and it's already pre-programmed. Whoever's in your shop running the machine can run the machine accurately because you don't have to worry about 
well, Jake's not really good at setting the tools. You know, we don't want Jake to be the guy to do it. And Tommy set it up before him, and we know how Tommy does things. Jake ain't figuring that out, right? Yeah, and that's exactly the problem. So, you know, sorry to all the Jakes and the Tommies out there. They're like, dude, why are you ragging on oh, me? Oh, we like you guys. Don't yeah. worry. But, no, it's, you know, when you start looking at that, you start having to think about there's different applications, different tooling. You know, that's something that people sometimes lose sight of. You know, with, with cabinetry, Woodworking tools are generally very similar. You know, you have your hardwood and softwood tools, but with with sign makers, you have a plethora of right. tooling that you could run into. And Absolutely. I mean, then you start getting into, let's just talk about ADA for a second. What if you're an ADA shop? You do ADA or Braille signs. Right. It's a whole different setup. There's a whole set of tools there. Yep. So tool changers are a must have. I mean, when you start looking in that application, you start getting into, you know, Braille and you start, you have to have tool changers. I mean, doing it without is a lot of programming and a lot of setup and it's just not fun. Right. Now you start going a little bit further into that. And what if you're a, a sign shop that does stuff with, you know, like Coroplast or you start getting into your corrugated cardboards? Well, now you have to add a knife to your machine. Yes, you do. Right? Creasing wheel. Yep. Yeah. Creasing wheel. And maybe you're a box maker. You do some of that stuff. Um, oh, maybe I could make a cardboard cutout of me standing in the room, right? I'd like to see that. Would that be cool? That would be cool. Who's going to make me a cardboard cutout of me? That would be actually neat. That'd be kind of cool. It would be. I'll put it right next to Garrett's desk. So when he walks, when he turns his head, oh, what he's doing? Just constantly over his shoulder. Yeah, he needs stare, it. He needs stare it. Stare right through his desk at him. That's a good idea. That is a good idea. A, I got <laughs> write that down. Let's write Note. that down. Note to self: make cardboard cutout of self. There we go. Got it. Perfect. Nailed it. Rudder Bob, that's your next project. <laughs> cardboard uh, cutout. <laughs> Brandon's cardboard cutout. Um, but yeah, so I mean, that's something you have to think about. Yep. What if you made a bunch of cardboard cutouts? I can't get over this. What if I made a bunch of cardboard cutouts and then just left them all over stores? Oh, that, I don't know, man. <laughs> if you just would, walked into like that? Menards with your just own cardboard cutouts. Just carry yourself underneath yep. your arm. And then you just leave yourself there in the aisle. Just right in the up. plumbing department. There's yeah. Brandon. Why do I have to be the plumbing department? I just feel like that's where you'd be. I don't know. <laughs> you know, did I tell you the story about the time I coned off an aisle at Menards? You did. That was a pretty funny time. Um, I wish we had time I, for that story. I just, I just wish I could see the reaction when you leave a cardboard cutout of yourself at the checkout lane. <laughs> just stop. Yeah, like I <laughs> oh, like the stop hand? Yeah. That would be great. And just, no, do not enter. See how many people don't enter that aisle? Oh, uh, we're children. Um, but yeah, so then, you know, get into the, you know, the world of the signs. Like you said, you got the, the knife applications. You got the creasing wheel applications. Now you got the tool changer applications mm -hmm. all on one machine. But now let's say you're a flatbed printer guy, right? Right. We have a flatbed printer. We have the OptiScout. Opti Scout. We have a video online. Garrett put something really great. Garrett, you put something together on that, didn't you? I sure did. Did you guys hear that? Garrett's got a mic this He's week. He's got a mic. He's got a mic. This is dangerous. This is dangerous. But yeah, no, Garrett put together a, a nice uh, video on the OptiScout. Yeah. Um, Garrett, you'll put, we'll repost that, I'm assuming, if we uh, need to after the show, right? We sure will. Awesome. And uh, the nice thing is that, that OptiScout is a feature that actually picks up printed registration marks. And by picking that up, it allows the machine to then cut around your graphics rather than accidentally cutting over the graphics. It and sounds so, convenient. Yeah, it's really convenient if you do a lot of flatbed printing. It's really not convenient if you don't do a lot of flatbed printing. Right. So you spend money on something <laughs> you don't need. So it goes back to the buy what you need. Right. If I don't have a flatbed printer, why am I buying a machine with a camera on it? Absolutely. Doesn't make sense to you. Well, that just goes back to what we're saying. That's why we take so time, so much time to sit and listen to what your needs are. Exactly. And that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here is that sign makers, there's two level of sign makers right there. Mm -hmm. And then you start getting into the plasma guys, right? Yeah. Are you a high def guy? Are you a standard definition guy? What do you need? What do you cut? Right. You know, and that's the thing is you, you buy these crazy expensive machines, right? Right. It doesn't even cut what you want it to because you bought the wrong cutter on it. Right. So now what do I do? A plasma cutter is a plasma cutter, isn't right. it? No. Yeah, exactly. You know, and that's the thing is you know, if I'm cutting quarter inch material versus cutting one inch material, I need a different cutter. Absolutely. You know, and in, in a one inch scenario, I need some heavy duty cutting forces or cutting ability. And Correct. I'm going to need something in a high definition or maybe with an oxy acetylene or oxy fuel torch. Yep. Something. Where your used machine may not even have the option for that. True. Then so you buy the something, then, then you call up, you're like, I'm going to put a cutter on there, and then it doesn't work. Now you just spent a bunch of money on something that's useless to you. By the time you get the machine to where you need it, you just bought a brand new machine. But guess what? The used guy, the guy selling the used machine to you told you it would do what you wanted to. Well, you seem trustworthy. <laughs> right? So trustworthy. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I don't know. There's, there's so much in the used market you have to be careful of. You, know, and, you do. You know, I think that's kind of funny because we talk to a lot of people that say, oh, I'm looking at this used machine. And you start having to, you know, kind of walk your way through it with them. Like, what about support? Who's going to support it? Because I promise you the OEM is not thrilled that 
they're supporting something they don't know anything about because we don't know what the guy before them did. And you, there's things that you have to think about. There's support costs. There's a lot of variables that go into yeah. the used machine. And let's be honest. I mean, my grandma, when you put her in a minivan, a rental minivan. She hammers on it, doesn't she? She's Mario Andretti, dude. Ah, my she's Mario family. Andretti. Hey, Mario Andretti, slow down. Let's pace ourselves. She's Mario Andretti when you get her in a minivan. But you put her in one of her vehicles, and she's the nicest driver ever. Yep. It's the same thing they're doing on these used machines. It, oh, I barely cut on it, though. Yeah, oh, Ten I took care of it. Look at it. It's so clean. Because <laughs> the guy just spent three hours cleaning that thing yep. to make you believe it was clean. Yep. Prior to you seeing it, it had rust all on the side of it, you know? Yep. Like, there's so many times that you have to be careful of that stuff, and... That's the problem with the used market there, you know, and you start looking at the plasma cutters, like I said, getting the right cutter. Do you need downdraft? Do you need water tables? There's certain applications, you know, in a situation where you do a lot of aluminum cutting, okay? Might have to go to a dry system. Yep, you know, because you're dealing with a lot of hydrogen. Yep. And you don't want to have that getting stuck in the water and having problems and concerns with, it, you know, explosions and non-fun stuff. Yeah. So you might need, you know, a dry table instead of buying a water table, right? Yep. yep. Or... Vice versa, maybe you're doing a lot of stainless. Well, water does help with oxidization, so you know it helps in a stainless application in a lot of cases. Yep. So there are certain places where water tables are better. You know, honestly, I prefer water tables personally just I like because it. they're a lot less cost of overhead because you're not running fans, filters. The EPA is really not stepping into that as bad. Water's readily available. Water's easy. Um, you also have the ability to clean the table out yourself real easy. You know, you're not dealing with, it's literally with ours, you drain the water right down, you know, your drain. Yep. You know, you don't have to mess around with pump trucks like you do with a, you know, a water jet machine and things like that. That'd be so, inconvenient. Yeah, there's some, there's some advantages to it. But um, then you start looking at, you know, job shops. What does a job shop need? Who knows? It could be anything from vibrating plate markers to oxy torches to yep. lasers. You never know. Yeah, and that's exactly it. You don't know what you need with a, a job shop. So yep. get as much as you can afford to get at that point, right? right? Because you could potentially use it. Do you need to you know, etch parts in your steel? Do you need to do you cut, need cut do, pipe? Do you need to drill holes? You know, like what, what do you need to do? We have drill heads. We have a pipe cutter. You know, there, there's application-specific options. And then that's just a job shop for plasma. What about right. a job shop for a router? Well, you're gonna cut acrylic. You're gonna cut aluminum. Are you gonna get into dye bond? Right. What about wood? You a lot know? of different options you need on the machine. So for you might need materials. Yeah, you might need some of the cabinetry packages, right? Yep. You might need some of the sign packages. You, you know? might need plastic packages. Yep. You have no idea. So there's a lot of things to think about. So when we talk about machines and configurations, there's specific needs and then there's specific configurations. Right. You know. So you know, as we start talking about it, let's talk about tooling and options and how many tools may be required. Right. That's the first thing we should be talking about with people, right? Absolutely. What are you doing so we can determine the tooling? Yep. You know, and then really let's let's kind of step back. Maybe there's people out there, you know, we kept saying tool changer. Maybe there's people out there that truly don't know understand what a tool changer does or its benefit. Right. So maybe, maybe we should talk about that real quick. You know, why is it why is it important for some people but not others? You know, what what would you say about a tool changer is the number one most important thing about it? What where do you think the benefit is there? To me, the most important benefit is the freedom. You don't have to hire somebody to stand there and watch the machine. It gives you the freedom to walk away to continue to make you know more money while your machine is doing your cutting. That's the biggest benefit to me. I would agree with that. You know, and that's that's one thing that why is it important for some and not others? Okay, well, if you have a ton of extra labor laying around, right? You yep. got people standing around doing nothing. Okay, maybe you can get by with having one of those guys stand at the machine. But a lot of people, you know, they have it backwards. I hear how many shops say. Well, I'm, I'm not a very big shop, so I don't need a tool changer. Excuse me, what? You need the tool changer, sir. Is that not more the reason to have the tool changer? It's the biggest reason to have a tool changer. It's, you know, a lot of people think, if I'm a big shop, then I get into a tool changer. If I'm a little shop, I don't need it. No. It should be the other way around. Yeah, I mean, with a little shop, you depend on that machine more, and you have less of you to run around and do stuff. Your time's so, more valuable. Correct, yeah. Like, the machine should be an employee then. Right. So adding a tool changer is a no-brainer. You know, at that point, you should be thinking about a tool changer. If you are a small number shop, Tool changer should be thought about. If you are doing a wide variety of materials, a tool changer should be thought yeah, about. Absolutely. And if you are doing a heavy process, you know, cut, where and what I mean by that, it's a, kind of a bad way of saying it, but do I need to drill holes, cut a slot, cut the part out, you know, doing a bunch of different things? Multifunction not, job. Yeah, you're not using a compression bit to cut a pocket and drill a hole. Right. You're going to start a fire. Simple as that. You're going to start a fire. So you need to use a drill bit to drill holes. That makes sense. Yeah. You need to use, you know, a tool designed for doing your, you know, flat bottoms or your pocketing so you don't end up having problems. 
and then you use a compression bit to cut the part out so it doesn't splinter and break apart. Right. So Sounds like you have a need for a tool changer. Tool changer. Exactly. We go back to it. Cabinet maker. Tool changer. Right? If you're doing dados, if you're drilling holes, if you're doing your Let's shelving. just be honest. What's the cost difference typically going from a manual to a tool changer anyway? It's only a few thousand dollars, you know? Right. Can, you, you, pay, can you pay someone that few thousand dollars to stand and change your bits? That's exactly what I always say. You know, you went exactly where I wanted to go with that because... It's because you, you taught me that. Yeah, you break down over a year, right? Break it down over a year. 12 months in the year. Break out the cost of what the tool changer costs you. It's pennies. It's about $500 a month, doesn't it come off to be okay? Something like that. Yeah, it's right around $500 a month. Yeah. And for $500, how many tools do you have to change before you reach that in a, labor? A lot. Yeah. Well, not really a lot. It's the opposite. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Brain, my brain had a fart yeah, there. not a lot. I mean, you change, you change tools and you end up with a really easy savings. I mean, the reality is changing tools will pay for it. As long as you're changing tools. If you're running the same bit for everything because you're cutting out squares out of plywood and that's it, tool changer yeah, probably is not good for you. Yeah, yeah, it's no good. Yep, you have a but, manual application that fits. Correct. But as soon as you have to drill a hole in that, that plywood or as soon as you have to put a slot in it that's not all the way through, a pocket, it's different tools. Simple correct. as that. Or tolerance cutting, okay? Sometimes you've got to get in a tight corner and you've got to square it off, right? Yep. Well, a corner can only be half the radius of a tool. So therefore, if you go into a corner, an inside corner, right, and you're going to take a quarter-inch bit, right? Yep. Your, your cut isn't going to be zero. You're not going to end up with a square corner. You have the half the radius of a quarter-inch tool. So as you start cutting these corners, you have a little bit of a roundover. Well, what if I need a tighter tolerance than that? I need a smaller tool. Yeah, change your bit. So it doesn't make sense to cut the whole part out with an eighth inch bit. No, use the right tool. Right tool. So you cut you cut the part out, you cut the center out with a quarter inch tool or even larger, three eighths tool maybe. Right. And then you come back with a smaller tool, an eighth inch or even a sixteenth inch or a thirty second or keep whatever going, you require. And square up the corners. And guess what? Now you have a square corner. A much closer to square corner. Closer. You know, it's never gonna be truly square because again, half the radius of the tool. Right. So that's where a tool changer can help you. It saves you time, money, headache. So that's one thing of why is it important for some and not others. Well, some people need to do multiple tools. That's why. Yep. Then you start talking about the labor of changing bits versus the machine. Yeah. As you mentioned, the labor should never be a factor there because the fact that the, the fact that a tool changer is cheaper than people, it pays for itself. Right. It's a no-brainer. Your guy is not going to work for $5,000 the rest of his life. No. So Let alone eventually, for even a year, right? Yeah, re- eventually, he's gonna, it's going to pay for itself, whether it's that month, the next month, or a few months down the road. It doesn't take long. Nope. And then you start looking at how dependable is it. The tool changer is pre-programmed. The tools are the tools. The heights are set. Everything's ready to go. There's no variable. Cut 10 sheets in a row, and it's the same tools doing the same thing over and over with the same program. Correct. Shouldn't have a change. Yep. Now take 10 sheets and tell Johnny to go cut them. <laughs> What's the chance that... Every time he cuts 10 sheets, they're exactly about, the same. I worry about Johnny. Yeah, I worry yeah. about Johnny. But the reality is... They're not going to come out the same. They're not, because they're not. it's not that Johnny's a bad employee. Nope. Johnny's a real employee. Johnny has a life. He's thinking about going jet skiing after work. Right. He's thinking about going fishing on the weekend. Or maybe he's tired by the 10th sheet. Yeah. And Johnny's worn out because it was 10 sheets a day, and he's on day five, so he's actually on his 50th sheet. Yeah. Guess what? He probably didn't do the same on the 50 as he did on one. I can imagine. So the reality is as Johnny gets tired or if things come up or somebody's talking to him somewhere, I, I measured that. We're good. But he didn't measure it. He did something wrong. Your quality's going to change. Throwing material away. So, again, dependability. Now let's go one step t- further from dependable let's say it's not johnny or maybe johnny isn't as good of an employee as we were hoping he was what if johnny doesn't show up don't need johnny to run the machine right if we have a tool changer yep i can start the program we can eliminate johnny that day yep Yep. and that's the thing is i have a customer of ours that i you know i've worked with for many years now and he added a cnc machine as his first real thing he bought in his cabinet business he's been going on for years now but he bought his cnc machine and he said he should have done it sooner because he, his employee couldn't make it to work this past winter because of a snowstorm. Mm-hmm. Heaven forbid there's snow in Minnesota Odd. and people can't get to work. Like he said, he goes, I didn't lose any days of work that week because he just walked out from his house to his shop, fired up his shop saber. He has it on time lapse. It's super awesome. Watch the whole machine cut. Oh, that'd be neat. Yeah. And he ran through all the sheets all day long because he just ran the machine then. So the reality is his shop kept moving 
Yeah, he wasn't making sales calls anyways. Like you said, he's not going to go out driving around because there was a snowstorm. Right. People weren't going to be around anyways. So he wasn't going to be out making sales calls. He just did the work in the shop and didn't have to bust his body up trying to keep up with the flow. Lost no days of production. Correct. And so from a dependability standpoint, whether you're sick, late, don't want to come in, whatever the issue is, you're, whatever your employee is dealing with, your machine can keep you running, can yeah. keep you moving. Absolutely. So there's another aspect of dependability on a tool changer. And then repeatability, as we mentioned, it's going to do what the file says over and over and over and over. Every single time. And over. And over. And over. And over. And over. So, you know, and then we talk about the ease of programming. You know, dual, due to the tool setup, you don't have to worry about variables. You measure the tools. The tools are the tools. Even if you break a bit, it measures the new tool and gets you back to where you left off. That's convenient. Have you ever tried cutting a program that's six and a half hours long and then breaking a bit at five hours in? No, I, I don't want to do that. I've done it. How'd you know you? how fun it is? No, it sounds terrible. It's super easy with a shop saver. You know why? Because I hit the tool height button, changed the bit, went back to work, done. Hmm, look at but that. without a tool changer, without some of these features, some of these other machines, this, that used machine, remember that really awesome used machine that you just scored an awesome deal on because you know that guy said he's the nicest guy ever and he just took care of it? Yeah, it looked really good. Yeah, and then he doesn't have a tool measure switch on it? I didn't notice that. So now how do you set your zero after you've cut away the surface five hours ago? That's a really good question. I hope you're really going to keep I'm going to call him and see if he'll come help me. Yeah, he's not helping you. He's already spending his money on something else and telling his buddies how dumb you were. But uh, the reality is, is tool height makes a huge difference. Yeah. Garrett, are you awake over there? Hey, yes, sleepy. Sir. Slow your roll, cuz. Wakey, wakey. I'm awake. Okay, just checking. Um... Anyways, so then, you know, now we've got figured out how we're going to cut it, right? We got a tool changer on this thing, right? Yep. How do you hold it? That's a good question. We can go a couple different ways with that. What do you prefer? Well, I'm going to say one thing. You can't cut what you can't hold down. That's very true. So you know what I prefer? Anything that holds the material from moving around and doesn't fly all over the place. There's my answer. <laughs> there you go. I don't want to get hit with a flying piece of two by four. No, we've seen some videos of that happening in shops. Yeah, I don't want to get hit by something. So... Hold the material down because if you don't, it becomes a projectile. That's dangerous. Yes. So you can't cut, but you can't hold down. See, me personally, I like vacuum. Yep. I'm a huge fan of vacuum, but vacuum doesn't work for everything. Right. The rule of thumb on hold down is what works for you may not work for the next guy. Right. And vice versa. Because how many times I hear people call me up, that guy's got a vacuum and it works just fine for him, but he's cutting four by eight sheets. You wanted to cut acrylic letters. In two inches yeah. in diameter. Yeah. Like, we got to think here. Work our way through it. Yep. You know, what he's using for a vacuum pump, you might need a different pump. Right. There is a thing such as HG versus CFM. CFM. Yeah. Flow versus pressure. Pressure is required in smaller parts. Flow is required in porous parts. So not all vacuums are created for the same jobs, right? Exactly. And then you get into, are you going to do nesting work? Are you going to do fixtures? Are you clamping something down? Are you screwing it down? Are you gluing it? There's no magic dust holding it down. I'll promise you that. That would be really cool, though. Like, remember the fairy that came and put the frames under our pillows? <laughs> what if you had a hold-down fairy? I remember that, a hold-down fairy. Well, good news. We can get you a hold-down fairy. Um, but you got to trust the facts. Yeah. Trust the science is what I always tell everybody. The reality is if, if the science doesn't add up, it's not going to work. Right. Like, the reality is is you generally want – rule of thumb here, okay? Rule of thumb. Anybody – Take a notes, take some notes. Rule of thumb, and this is according to Becker Vacuum, who is one of the number one vacuum manufacturers in the entire industry, is 5.5 CFM for every square foot of surface area. 5.5 square feet. Nope, you already messed I it already up. I already messed it up. See, I'm not taking notes. Can yeah. I borrow your pen? I no. need to write this down myself. No, get your own. 5.5. You don't have a pen in that beard? <laughs> Wait a minute, I haven't checked. I haven't checked. Yeah. Hey, look at that. Yeah. Look at that. There's a pen in there. Uh, 5.5. CFM for every square foot. Write that down, people. So the reason I say that is because you start looking at some of these other machines and you do the math and it doesn't add up. How many times have you seen that? Yeah. Someone will send a quote across and yep. the vacuum's way undersized for the yep. table. Or you start looking at the fact that they barely have enough CFM and they have almost nothing for pressure. Well, that's not well, going to work. You didn't really help yourself there because if you're lacking in pressure, you need to overcome it with volume. See, right. You know, so CFM. So you can't have low CFM and low volume, or excuse me, low CFM and low pressure 
and expect parts to hold. No. It just doesn't work. That's going okay. to be a nightmare. Good news. You saved money in your pocket. Good job. You can't hold anything down while but you cut. I hope you bought yourself a riot shield because you're going to get hit. <laughs> like, seriously. I hope it came with a riot shield. Because if it didn't, stand back. Stand back. You know, and the reality is, is edge quality is based a lot of times on a hold down. If right. a part's vibrating and moving around, it's going to show a different finish than yep. if it's secure. Yep. You know, and then you start getting into, you know, things that are single phase versus three phase, right? There's certain applications where you don't have three phase available, right? So right. shops. So then you need a different vacuum pump. You yep. can't just get the one size fits all vacuum pump. Uh, there's not really a one size fits all. Yeah. Right. Don't buy a Chinese vacuum pump. Let's stop do, there. Do not. Like they're always going to be based wrong. I mean, it's always based on a price, not a performance thing. Correct. You know, there's nothing out there about a Chinese vacuum pump that's ever a good solution. I, I agree with you. You know, will they work? Yes. And there's some guy out there right now like, you idiot, Brandon, I got one and it works fine. Well, you are a very small you're a, minority. You're a unicorn. Yeah, like you are a unicorn because it's very rare that Chinese vacuum pumps last long and don't hit you in the gonads with a piece <laughs> of flying material. I'm going to be honest with you. I said it. Don't care. Gonads. Uh, <laughs> but anyways. Yeah, my gonads are tucked inside my abdomen. Then we start talking about, you know, fixtures. If you're going to, you really liked that one, didn't you? You doubled down on it. You really doubled yeah, down. I, I wasn't expecting that. Don't bro. care. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the reality, ask me how I know. Don't care. Um, but they, uh, <laughs> the uh, fixture side of it, you got to clamp stuff down sometimes, okay? Correct. Sometimes it's not just clamping fixtures. It's vacuum fixtures. Right. So we've got guys that use pods. There's, there's a small group of people out there that use pods. Yeah. Pods, pods were really popular a long time ago before nesting, yeah. but they are still popular for certain applications. We'll yep. talk about that here, but you know, one, it would be when you get into C axis and aggregates, and I'll talk about that a little bit further in the episode, yeah. but you know, one thing that you have to think about with a C axis is you have to come in from the side. That means the material has to be raised off the table or right. a roundover bit, for yep. example. Hey Garrett, we have a video on roundover bits, do we not? Yes. Yes, that's in the, you like that? Yes. Yes. I get the one word. Yes. Thanks um, for your input. Thanks for the wordy answer there, pal. Um, Can I have a mic? Can I have a mic? Can I have a mic? And we give him a mic and he says, yeah. <laughs> you didn't even say yeah. Yes. Um, Jesse, you want to keep your mic or should I? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> there he is. Um, there's Garrett for you, folks. Um, but yeah, with the pods, it's something you need to think about. And if you want to go to our website, you can go to our educational video section, type in pods. You'll see this in demonstration. But yep. The pods allow us to raise the material off the table without losing vacuum. Right. They're kind of neat. They're kind of neat. Down for blah, 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 blah. Let's try this again. Spit it out. Okie dokie. Let's try. So the benefit, yes, nailed it. The benefit of a pod is the fact that it holds a part that maybe is a unicorn, if you will. Right? Yeah. An odd shape, a weird thing. Something you're not using all yeah, the time. Something that has to be raised up. Okay? The downfall is you can do zero nesting with a pod system unless you have a bunch of pods and you're really good at figuring out where you put the pods so you don't run into them. So the downfall is it slows you down in certain applications. But the reality is as you raise that part up, you're focusing the air on a certain area. Okay? So let's say you got a little small end table tabletop. Yep. And you put it up because you want to put the round over, the nice round over so when you walk up against it, you don't, you know, rip your hand open because it's super sharp. Tear your jeans. Hit you in the self and the gonads. The gonads. <laughs> um, anyways, the reality is when you look at that, it's got a nice clean round over. It's really decorative looking. It's beautiful. Yeah. But it was put on there by a special bit. Yep. Well, that bit had to be able to have clearance on top and bottom. So they raised the material up. Well, that pod has to deliver a ton of hold down in a small amount of area. Right. So you need a lot of pressure going through a pod to hold the material down. CFM does you no good because there's no leakage. CFM does not matter. Right. That's where you want your heavy. It's 100% HG. HG at that yep. point. So again, the more that you can concentrate hold down on your part, the better it's going to hold down. So pods, you know, fixtures, you know, there's certain things where you can get into that work really, really well for holding odd shapes. Yep. You know, I have a gentleman of ours that we work with that uh, he does mandolins. We call it the mandolin factory. Another video you can check out on our YouTube channel if you want to check it out. But he makes mandolins. And the mandolins are set up in stages. So he cuts, and in each run is four parts. But it's a different part every time. So when it runs over, it's cutting one base, one neck, you know, whatever the case may be, one back, right. everything. And basically, the first time he ran it, he cut one part. The, the main top. Then the second time he ran it, he moved that top, flipped it upside down. So now he ran a new top and the back of the other one. Then the third step was the neck, you know, and he kept moving. And by the time he set it up, every time he runs a program, he gets one complete mandolin off the machine. That's nice. Yeah. And it's done by vacuum hold down, which 
Most go, how do you hold it down? Because it's so narrow. He created vacuum hold down fixtures. Jig fixtures. Yeah. So it's the same part over and over. It's repetitive. Yeah. He doesn't do versatility. It's the same thing. Yep. One fixture does the same thing over and over. And so therefore vacuum works really, really slick in that. And again, by doing that, you don't have to worry about clamp screws, all that fun stuff because you're using vacuum hold down to your benefit. So vacuum is really great if you can make it work. Right. But let's get into a situation like Live Edge. As we get into Live Edge, you can't always hold vacuum or hold Live Edge down with vacuum, right? Yeah, not all the time. I've seen some pieces of Live Edge that make almost a 180, right? I mean, yeah. they've just got these gnarly curls to them. Yeah. But they're a really cool piece of lumber. They are. And you don't want to throw them away. You don't want to not use them. So you got to plane them. Yep. Well, how do you plane something that doesn't sit flat? Uh, you're gonna have to clamp that down, right? You're gonna have to create a flat surface that we can hold down. That way we can use a vacuum in that application so we go to clamps. Exactly. And as you clamp something down, it gives you the ability to do some unique stuff as well. Yeah. So you clamp it down, you start planing it, you get it flat, and then guess what you can use? The vacuum. So therefore now you can have a hybrid system, vacuum and clamps. And you can see a video of this on Shop Saber as well, right? Yeah, so exactly. On our website as slab well. Slab table we do with Bob. Yeah, correct. We did a slab table. We did a live edge table. Yep. Which, by the way, is not as easy as I thought it was going to no, be. It was what, a lot of fun, though. What a nightmare. Man, try mixing resin all the time. Try mixing that glitter. If remember that, oh, that glitter. <laughs> glitter. God, it went everywhere. Yeah. Jeez, that was a mess. Um, nevertheless, all you guys who did live edge tables that made me believe I could do it, too. You lied to us. You were really good at doing it because <laughs> I believed it was as easy as you showed me. Uh, it actually wasn't too bad once you figured it out. Yeah, I had the, a lot of fun on that. The table part of it was the easy part. It's that resin. Yeah. I guess the resin wasn't even hard if I would have just bought enough resin. Problem is, I didn't buy enough resin. Then I remember I bought that other resin. Remember that box showed up like six more gallons. Oh my of god! Resin. What a nightmare! It was and, really cool though watching that table get or that table get fly cut. Like yeah. watching Bob clamp everything down to create that flat surface and yep. then get that flip so we could utilize vacuum. Yeah, that was and, really cool. Yeah, like I said, so that's the kind of stuff like you have to think about how you're gonna hold it down. Yeah. And then in some cases, guys just run an old fashioned screw right through their material. Right. Yep. This is gonna be a wasted piece of material anyways. Screw it down. Make life easy. Cut what they need. Move on. Right? Perfect. Like. There are applications where screwing something down makes sense. Or, you know, I've seen guys, you know, one of my favorite things is double-sided tape. Bob does it once in a while. Yep. He uses a double-sided 3M carpet tape. And you think to yourself, cover yourself. It's coming, right? <laughs> yeah, it works really well, though. It works great because yep. the reality is, is it keeps it from sliding. You're not necessarily lifting on those type of applications. A lot of times you're using a down-cut bit, so it's pressing down on the material. You're yep. just trying to keep the side-to-side -side slide. And it works really, really well. Um, some guys have actually used, I've seen guys use super glue and tape together. You know, that's, super glue. Yeah, they super glue the tape to itself, and then they tape it to the material, so that way when they're done, they just peel it off the back of their material. Fair enough. It's pretty sweet. Never would have thought super glue, though. Yeah, there's a video out there. We didn't do it. There's a video out there, though, on super gluing stuff down. Can you there's, see the two of us super glue and tape to something? I can't see We'd you. We super, super glue our hands to each other. I wouldn't super glue my hand to you. Oh, yeah, you no, would. No, I would. No. i away from you as fast as I can. <laughs> That beard, no chance. Just super glue your hand to my You'd beard. You'd have like Cheetos. Oh, super that'd be glue terrible. Beard. <laughs> Nasty. Uh, but actually, I think I see a Cheeto in that beard still. Um, yeah, I'm kind of hungry. <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, holding down is something you need to think about. Yeah. Think about the facts. What's going to keep you from moving around? It's very important. So it's one of the things that you can look at is when do you buy vacuum? When you have to do nested work, when you have to do fixture hold down, you know, that's when you look at, you know, vacuum. Right. What and why? Then let's talk about let's talk about plasma cutting for a second, right? All you plasma cutter guys who listen, and then you're like, you guys are talking about a bunch of stuff I don't care about. Let's talk about plasma for yeah, a second. Yeah, let's get those guys excited. Okay, let's talk about it. And that's the end of plasma. No, I'm just kidding. Have a good day, um, guys. <laughs> you know, what's the difference between amperage versus needs? You know, when are you not buying enough? When are you buying too much? Well, the reality is everybody thinks it's like horsepower. You can never have enough. Right. False. That's there false. are applications where if you buy too big of a cutter, you are not going to be able to do certain, certain things. Right. When you get into um, thicker cutting, yep. you need a lot more amperage. You do. The higher the amperage you have, the thicker the materials are that you can cut. And when you get into that, therefore, you get a straighter curve. You get less of you know, a bevel. You, you have just less issues with it. Right. Okay? Problem is, you get that really high, powerful torch, and then you try to cut really thin stuff. It's not going to turn out You so disintegrate hot. it. Yeah, you're going to melt it. It's like the death ray. Just gone. <laughs> Bye, <tough> material. <laughs> Hope we got extra. Have a nice day. Right. So you want to make sure you have the right size cutter for the application. For sure. And then, you know, they, everybody says you can cut one inch, right? Every, everybody. everybody. Oh, that cuts one inch. Okay. Can it? Yeah. Is it going to do it well? No. 
Like there's a right and a wrong cutter for one inch material. So tell me what you're really cutting for one, right? right? Let, let's talk about that. When I say, what do you cut normally? Don't just throw out one inch because it sounds good. Like, let me know that if you're really cutting quarter inch material, let's talk about it right. because we can get you a cutter that will still be able to do some stuff on a one-off basis. But if you're cutting one inch every day, your quote's going to look very different. Most conversations, though, how, what are you cutting? How much do you want to cut? Oh, I want one inch capability. Yeah. That is everybody. Yeah. Or you get the sales guy that they call us up. The customer calls us up and says, well, that sales guy said he could sell me the 65. It cuts one inch. No problem. Good He's luck. a liar. Good luck. Like, it's slow. Will it cut it nice? Will it do a good job? If you're willing to be patient, yes. But is it designed for that? No. no. Like, make sure you get the right cutter. It does not just cut one inch. Because it says it can pierce one inch, well, read the fine print. That's also with a hand cutter, not right. with a machine torch, not right. on a CNC machine, not with a torch eye control system. Yep. So unless you're going to take it off the machine every time, do it by hand, and then stick it all back together, you're probably buying the wrong cutter. Sounds convenient. Super convenient. And then you got to talk about speed versus quality, right? In right. certain applications, you want to go fast, and quality doesn't matter. Right. Some applications, quality is your number one priority, so guess what? You're going to give up some speed. Right. Think about the guys that are doing art signage. The faster you go, the more the flame moves around. Yep. So think about that. The better the quality you need, the slower you need to go. And yes, that means sometimes you're going to have more dross, more cleanup. There's things that factor into that. Find out what the facts are of what you're trying to do. Don't just listen to the sales guy trying to sell you the really expensive machine. Yeah, absolutely. Or trying to sell you the really cheap one because that's what he has on the shelf. Does so it work? Determine what you need to determine your answer. And then we get into things like, let's go back to, you know, both applications, I guess, router and plasma, but drill heads, right? Right. There's Two types of drill heads. You have the drill head that is for closets, cabinetry, that type of stuff. And right. you have the metal drills. Yep. Drills work really, really well when you need to do a lot of holes. Okay. In a plasma, the rule of thumb is one to one ratio or larger. Right. So if you need to cut a quarter inch hole on half inch material, you need a drill. Yep. You can't do it with a plasma. No. With a router, you buy a drill bit for what you're doing. I hear so many guys say like, they told me I can't drill with the spindle. Why? Why? Like, is Why? the machine going to break? Is it like that fragile that the dr drill procedure on your CNC machine is going to break it because the spindle can take it. I promise you that. So don't let them blame anything else. It's reality is with stuff like shop zipper, super Z technology, you can drill holes without an issue all day long. Yeah. And we get people to do it all the time. And so when you start looking at machines with drill heads on it, either, well, you have to buy the drill head cause that's all the only way it comes. Well, what if I don't need the drill head? Well, what if I'm not doing closets? Don't look at it. Don't look at it. It's, it's invisible now. Don't see it. It's don't like, look at it. It's like a T-Rex. Look away. If you don't move, it doesn't see you either. Is that true? I don't know. I've never seen a T-Rex. I saw a Jurassic Park once, though. But, uh, yeah. So, the competitors are going to say you require it. Why? They like money. That's why. Exactly. Because the drill head is something they make a lot of money well, on. it's a huge money item, yeah. right? For cabinets, here's a true fact, okay? Here's a fact for you. I've ran a simulation. We have it on our website again. If you watch a machine cut a base cabinet with a drill head and one without, the time savings over 11 sheets of material was less than four minutes. It's pretty incredible. So when you think about only a four minute savings for the amount of money you're spending on a drill head, it's not worth it. Right. Think about how many sheets you just said you processed. Yeah. That's a lot of sheets. It's a lot of sheets and you're only saving four minutes for 10 grand. 40 seconds a sheet. Yeah. No, I'm good. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll drill it with the regular way. Right. Unless your machine's running all day, every day, multiple shifts, four minutes isn't going to make or break your day. No. And you're going to save a ton of money. Now, put yourself in a cabinet world, right? Yep. You cut commercial cabinets all day long, but you cut a lot of, excuse me, I said cabinet world. Closet, closet, closet world, organizers. I'm sorry. I got you. I Way was coming. I was coming. Hey. Okay, gotcha. But yeah, you cut a lot of commercial closets, right? Yeah. Well, you're putting thousands of holes all day long. Correct. It might make sense to gang drill those, right? It could. Because your holes are all lined up in a row, just straight down it. Yep. It's not like a base cabinet where you got onesie, twosie holes here and there. Yeah. That is the same thing over and over. You're going to save time nah, with the drill you're head. you're going to gain some speed. Well, what if I don't do that right away, but I might do it down the road? That's a really good question. Shop Saber can let you upgrade because with our IS series, it's versatile. You Absolutely. can add it on, right? Yep. So the advantage to having a drill head on the machine, you know, later might be there. But to buy it today when something you might never use we doesn't talk, make sense. We talk about it all the time. Get the machine in. Figure out what you're going to do. If you don't think you're going to use a drill block, let's order one when there's a need. Yeah, no, for sure. So, you know, when you look at that, there's certain needs for it, certain applications. Um, you know, fourth axis. What the hell is a fourth axis? That's, I asked that right away. What the hell is this thing? Yeah, well, what is a fourth axis? Well, it's either a C axis, which is a, you know, aggregate capable right. device. Yep. There's a rotary axis, which can do indexing. like spindles, indexing, yep, yep. Things, like that, things like that. And, you know, additional axes can be considered a fourth axis. Right, like you a know? knife. Yeah, if you have a knife head on it, you have a drill head on it. There's a multiple ways that you can come up with a fourth axis. Yep. Now, an indexer is what you make 
things like posts, pillars, railings, things like that. Table legs, chair yep. spindles. C axis is what allows you to turn an aggregate so you can go in and do like hinge pockets, doing tongue you know, and groove. Yeah, things like that. Um, getting into the round overs as we talked about, yep. things like that. And then you get into additional axis, knife heads, which cuts your corrugated materials and such. Fabric. Um, yep, your drill heads, things like that. So yep. there's your fourth axis. That's what it is. Now, rotary axes don't make sense for everybody. If you're trying to make money in mass production, rotary axes are a terrible way to do it. Yeah. The reality sure. is set up fixtures, m cut multiples at one time, and then flip them all manually and cut them all again, and you're going to produce a lot more parts in less time. Way faster. If you want something that can build one-off decorative stuff and you're going to spend a bunch of time doing it and you're going to charge a crap ton of money for it and it's yeah. not really mass production, yep. rotary indexers are a great option for that. Yeah, they are. Now, get into C-axis versus fixtures. Again, C-axis makes sense if it's so complex that you can't create a, a fixture for everything you're doing. Right. But the reality is, like doors and things like that, there's door machines. There's things out there that you can buy that are a lot faster, yep. that pocket things and do that. Versus trying to come in from a CNC machine and cutting facade. The reality is, is you're going to spend 20 to 30 grand in a lot of cases to add a C-axis aggregate setup for something you might not do more than 10 times a year. Right. It's not a cheap option. So it, again, buy the option you need, not what the sales guy tells you you're going to have to use. Right. Yep. We and do then, a really good job of going deep into that though. Like we make sure we understand you're, are you really going to use this or not? Yeah. We know? talk about cool versus, you know, actual benefit. Like, yeah. you know, it's cool. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to tell you it's not a cool thing to have in your machine, but Let's not, I'm going to be a bad sales guy for a minute and tell you, don't spend your money. You don't Absolutely. need to on we, certain options. We tell people that all the time. Yeah. You know, and then you talk about options in general. You know, when you talk to a consultant, you get a more in-depth understanding of what you're getting, right? Yeah. We build you a machine for your application. Yeah. When you buy a used machine, you get whatever the heck was on that machine, whether the last guy needed it or not, whether he used it or not. That's what you're getting. Yep. Get what you need. You, you really get a better value well, for your money. Why would anyone pay for something that they don't need? That doesn't make any Correct. sense. It doesn't. And then, you know, you start getting, you know, roped into the, you know, spending money side of things with a lot of guys because, well, this is what I got. I got this $80,000 machine, but it's got everything you have to have. But I'm a startup cabinet company. You don't need an $80,000 drill head machine. I'm sorry. I love those calls when a guy gets off the phone with a competitor and calls us and I get to yep. talk him out of half the stuff that guy talked him into. Yeah. And then, you know, but then the flip side. Don't cut corners because you're cheap. Exactly. That can kill your business. The number one way to fail with a CNC machine is buy the wrong CNC machine. Yeah, don't be cheap. Yeah, I mean, you get guys out there that are looking at, well, your machine with a tool changer is this price, but the Chinese one is 20 grand cheaper. Go buy the Chinese one and I'll talk to you in a year. Yeah, if that. Yeah, like the reality is, is there's a good chance you're going to buy another machine. Absolutely. Because there's a reason why they're cheaper. Don't buy the machine without the tool changer if you need a tool changer. If we're telling you need it and we can show you why you need it, don't just go looking for the guy who's willing to lie to you. Because I'll promise you, if you look hard enough, you're going to find the guy who will tell you what you want to hear. Absolutely. You're going to buy the machine without the tool changer, and you're going to remember Brandon or Jesse or any of the guys here saying, you should have bought the tool changer, and you're going to think to yourself, damn it, they were right, and now I'm not calling them back because I don't want to admit it. I've already seen it this year. Guys, I've sold machines to last year. I say, hey, we really need the tool changer, yep. and we didn't do it. And now, we're, hey, how do we add a tool changer? Yep. Get what you require. Yep. Don't overthink it, for one. Not what you saw or what you think you need. Find out, ask questions. Ask the sales guy to explain the, how it works. If he can't explain it, he doesn't know. Right. Why do I need this? Yep. If you can't get that answered, Correct. you don't need it. Yeah, where's its benefit? You know, talk about the expansion capability things. You know, let's talk about that for a second. Can I upgrade in the field? Yeah. Maybe you, you can't afford the tool changer today, but I want the quality ball screw machine, right? Because yep. I'm going to keep it for 10 years. Add the tool changer in the field. But go into it knowing you're going to do it. Buy right. the machine that's capable of doing it. Don't buy the machine that can't have the tool changer added in. Buy the one that can have it. You're going to spend a little bit more money. Again, don't be cheap. Buy the one that you can afford to upgrade into later on. Buy the bells and whistles as you grow your company. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And then I don't you, think there's a lot of companies out there that are telling people that either, though. Yeah. Well, that's, there's a lot of bad sales guys out there. There are. You know, and, you know, buy what you don't need later, right? I don't even like that word, sales guy. I know. That's why I don't. Consultant. Yeah. That's why we're consultants around consultants. here because I don't, I don't hire sales guys. Sales guys sell you stuff you don't need. Yep. Sales guys come knocking on your door after the hail. And they end up on your roof. How many guys have you stopped by your house this week? I think we're up to 29. That's insane. We got baseball size hail at my house this last week. And it was absolutely crazy. And literally these guys run up to our door. They're pounding on the door. You know, like within minutes after the, I think they were still hailing on the one guy. And I mean, they're literally like, oh, your house has damage. You got to get, like, you haven't even been up to my roof yet. You know, like, how do you know? Like, he's not wrong. It had damage. But I mean, dude chill out a second. Let's talk. Right. And then, I mean, they're literally hanging door hangers or we just stopped answering the phone. We, we, we had that ring doorbell. So yeah. just, I could see who it was. I just stopped answering. Do you ever and talk to him through that? No, I don't have, I don't want to sit and have a conversation, but you know, I have CNC machines to build. I don't have time to talk to those guys, but 
Yeah, they're hanging their door hangers over each other, fighting over it, right? I come out, and there's a guy on the roof of my neighbor's <laughs> house. My neighbor's not home. I know he's not home. He just climbs up. He just climbed up on the roof and started inspecting it. And I'm just watching him, and these ladders sitting up against the house. And all I could think was, go take the ladder. Did you? No, I didn't take the ladder. I should have. You should have. I told my neighbor to, if he sees it on my house, told him to go take the ladder. Because I thought, what better way than to teach him a lesson than take his ladder and send tell him. A ma- send a message. Call your buddy to come get a ladder for we'll you, right? Fire department. Yeah, like, dude, you you shouldn't go on somebody's roof without their permission, first off. Oh, that's a no that's brainer. Some, that's a pretty bold move. But, yeah, they were doing it, man. That's crazy. So, you know, like I said, going back to sales guys, there's some really bad sales guys. I met a guy. He walked door to door. He came up to our door, was really respectful, told us flat out that I know I'm probably the 400th person you've seen. Here's the deal. If you want my help, I'm more than willing to go through it. And he was really consultative about it. He explained to me what we're looking for. Really nice guy, no pressure, you know, answered questions that I had. He was easy to deal with. Yeah. That's a good sales guy. Right. He was, I was willing to talk to him. These other guys come up telling me I already have damage. Dude, you haven't even been on my roof yet. Right. You, you know, how do you know I didn't have an air balloon hanging over the top of it, right? right? Like, you don't know. Like, I don't have an air balloon hanging over the top That'd of it. That would be sweet. It would be sweet. That's what we should invent. A safety shield for your roof during a hailstorm. That is actually kind of genius. Okay, I don't have time for that. <laughs> We're not doing that. Somebody else can do Why it. Why do you get me so excited? Like, but oh. my son was playing baseball with hail outside. You know, that's what we're doing. You know, and I'm like, we're just having a good time. These guys are already banging on the door. And, and I, like, was, I was busy calling the insurance company yeah, for the car. Yeah, your car got hit. I know it got just. Crushed. Yeah, just absolutely pummeled. Looks like a Titleist golf ball it now. Does. It looks. I bet it's really aerodynamic now, though. <laughs> it got a little faster. <laughs> yeah, better MPGs now. Yeah, about four more. Yeah. Just because of the hail. Just because of the hail damage. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, we got a bunch of storms up here. I mean, everybody's okay. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, got a little bit damaged, but you know what? That's why we have insurance, right? Yep. We, uh, we learned a valuable lesson. Aluminum does not do well outside. No, it doesn't. <laughs> so, Ford, thanks for the aluminum vehicles. That didn't work out so hot for some. But, uh, yeah, we, uh, we had a good time with that. So, anyways, getting back to the topic. I mean, we're kind of wrapping it up here. But, you know, what options and when? You know, that's something you need to understand. What options and why? You know, Find out more about the options you're getting. There are applications where, you know, certain options make sense for certain things. But don't always believe the hype. Don't buy the turnkey cookie cutter machine. Find out what you can get. And be thorough. Like, when you're on the phone with your sales guy, really be thorough. Make sure he understands your application. Make sure he knows all the materials you're working on. That he knows what jobs you're bringing in. Because it really helps on this side. Like, we don't make recommendations just for fun. We really listen and try to give you the best options available for what you're doing. Exactly. You know, Garrett, you had a mic this whole time, and you didn't say hardly three words other than, yep. You guys are killing it. I don't want to interrupt. <laughs> oh, is that why it was? Well, we might not give you a mic next week because I, I thought... I think we should take it away. I thought this take was going to be more... Away. You were going to be more involved. Well, Garrett has swim ear right now, I believe, right? Get, Eric, isn't that... I do. I have swimming ear. Swimming ear. Swimming ear. Your ear's swimmers. going... Sw- swimmers. Swimmers. Yeah. Swimmers ear. Okay. Yeah, he actually had me put drops in it earlier. Yeah, so, I mean, Garrett has just been out of it today. He's... Just not feeling really great right now, but you're getting better, aren't you? I'm in it. I'm still here. You're still here. You're doing good. Your hair looks phenomenal. Your hair does yeah, look. His hair looks super great. Yeah. That's that's why I had to shave my head because his hair made mine look really bad. L- luscious head of flow there. Unbelievable. <laughs> Just the nice flow. You think you played hockey? Should have played hockey. Ah, no, look hockey at hair right there. Hockey bro. hair, but not a hockey player. <laughs> but. You know, I hope everybody had fun listening to that. If you guys got questions, reach out to us. Obviously, we're always willing to answer questions on options, configurations. Jesse, I know you're willing to take the calls, right? Anytime. Call, email, carrier pigeon, whatever you need, whatever's convenient. Whatever works for you, you know, send it all over our way. We'll always take care of you. If you can email us, sales at shopsaber.com is always a good way to get a hold of us. Yep. Um, like I said, anything anybody needs, you know, as far as uh, information on this topic, we're more than happy to help. But I'm Brandon. I'm Jesse. Thanks for talking shop with Shopsaber. Saber.